something that affords us a more critical insight into the acceleration of capitalism in 16th and early 17th century England than the persistent and the repeated efforts of the state to slow it down, and of the established Anglican Church, which emerged from the English Reformation to moralize the social practices and the economic practices of 16th century England. And nothing affords us a more critical clue to the causes of that great English revolution, which was to explode in the 1640s, than the patent failure in that exercise in social restraint and economic regulation. For by the time you get to the middle of the 17th century, you will find that those emergent capitalists who are rich and resentful, who have in no way been curbed by this kind of exercise in restraint, who are operating in agriculture and in trade and in industry, are now hell-bent on removing the fetters to their enterprise, and are so subordinating the state to their purposes that it will be from then on a very pliant ally and not a very suspicious disciplinarian. The point I am making is certainly not that in any doctrinal or systematic way, the Tudor and early Stuart monarchs were opposed to trade or industry. What I am saying is that their interest and their support for trade and industry was very sporadic, it was always half-hearted, and inevitably it was self-interested. That that support, after all, was grounded in considerations of national power and of national security rather than in any solicitude for the profits and the opportunities of the emergent capitalists of England. And so it was that those monarchs of the 16th and early 17th century did support overseas trade insofar as that trade really increased the customs revenues that went into the royal treasury. But if it were a question, for example, of deploying the power of the state in order to break open new overseas or colonial markets, then the state was extremely reluctant to do that. Consider, if you please, that in the first two decades of the 17th century, English overseas merchants entreated their government over and again to give them support in their struggle against Dutch rivals who were driving them off the seas, who were taking one overseas market after another from them, and that those entreaties, after all, fell on deaf ears, both the ears of Elizabeth, the last of the Tudors, and James I, the first of the Stuarts. It is true that we find instances in that 16th and early 17th century in which the state supported the promotion of native industry. We find it, for example, in the law of 1553, when the state places a prohibition on the import into England of foreign hats and caps in order to buttress the native hat-making industry. We find it more dramatically in 1557, when the state legislates that there shall be a limit now placed on the amount of white, unfinished cloth that can be exported to foreign cities, where it will then be finished and dyed. And that, of course, in the interest of creating employment in the native dyeing and finishing industry in England. But all of those instances that we can gather together have nothing to do with a doctrinal support for industrial capitalism. What they have to do with is a fear that unless there is sufficient employment, there will be social upset and social unrest in England, which can threaten the stability of the realm. It is true that we do find those pieces of legislation that effectively try to protect what we call nascent or infant industries in 16th and early 17th century England. And the instrument chosen for that is the patent or the right of monopoly, uh, so that monopolies are sold by the crown to certain very fortunate and selected entrepreneurs who thereby avoid the risk of their capital investment, who, so long as they have a monopoly, can be assured of large and steady return. 
But in its origin, that system of monopolies, which we date back to the Elizabethan period in the middle of the 16th century, in its origin, that policy, after all, was geared toward military considerations. It was geared toward buttressing the military capability of the crown so that those monopolies were originally given for the production of those commodities that are basically more materiel, like saltpeter or like gunpowder. And the very first of them, which is the Elizabethan royal mines, was created in order to make England independent of foreign sources and supplies of copper. And then when you get down to the turn of the 17th century, even that purpose disintegrates and the granting of monopolies for money becomes sheerly a fiscal racket. So that what the state is doing is selling those monopolies in certain industrial fields in order to buttress its treasury. All of which means, of course, that there are all kinds of very ambitious would-be capitalists who become bitterly resentful of the fact that they are excluded from the expanding of production and the creation of new markets. You see, the point I am making is that both the Tudor and the Stuart monarchies, especially down until the Civil War of 1640, had a profound apprehension about the staggering and the shattering impact of an aggressive and expansionist capitalism upon the stability of the realm, upon its social peace and order. You see that those monarchs, after all, were the legatees of the medieval social order and of the theory of that medieval social order. They, after all, thought to deploy the power of the state in very good Gramscian fashion in order to preserve the hegemony of the traditional ruling class. They had no more exalted purpose in their politics and in their social policy than, after all, to preserve the social pyramid, to make sure that the society of ranks and estates was kept intact, to make sure that everyone in his rank and estate had some kind of protection, to make sure that the laboring poor were not driven to that brink of despair which would make them, after all, a class in revolt. And consequently, capitalism constituted a tremendous problem because it moves like a bull in a china shop. It is expansionist. It is aggressive. It, after all, overturns rule and custom. It threatens a society of ranks. It threatens a society of customary protections. Old laws and old customs fall like flies. And against that inflationary spiral, which cannot be controlled in the 16th century, what alternatives did the monarchs of 16th and early 17th century England have except to curb the appetites of the capitalists, to curb that expansionism, or to risk and to face social upheaval from below? And it's in that context that you can understand that phenomenal fact that in the year 1549, the year of so-called Pest Rebellion, the year when there was a great Pest Rebellion in the north of England, dr uh, peasants driven to that insurrection by their despair at the enclosure movement and at the expropriation of their land, in that very year of Pest Rebellion, the King Edward VI, favorite ideologue, the man who so deeply influenced him produced a tract in which he urged upon the king to practice the traditional ancient strategy of stewardship. We are talking, of course, about Thomas Bucer. Thomas Bucer, who is the tutor to the King Edward VI, and who is himself a professor of divinity at Cambridge, and who in 1549 writes a tract that will be influential called De Regio Christi on the Christian Commonwealth. 
And in that tract, he not only elaborates the principles of Christian politics as he sees them, but he also elaborates a strategy of social conservatism to which every Tudor and early Stuart monarch, in one variant or degree or another, would finally adhere. And what is it that Bucer preaches to the king and that so influences him? What is, after all, this idea of stewardship, which is to inform the monarchy and is to keep that conservative social order intact? It is, of course, that able-bodied idlers must be excommunicated by the church and must be punished by the state. But it is also, says Bucer, that the state must be a pious mercantilist, that it must guarantee that the woolen industry will remain intact because people are clothed that way. It must guarantee that arable land is not converted into pasture because people eat that way. And finally, it must beware of the merchants. It must beware of the capitalists because they are driven by ambition, they are driven by ego, they do not concern themselves with the good of the common weal. For, the tr for though trade in itself, writes Bucer, is honorable, most merchants are rogues. Indeed, next to the sham priests of the Roman church, no class of men is more pestilential to the commonwealth. And so what Bucer recommends really is like an echo out of those scholastic tracts of the 13th century because he recommends that the state set just prices regardless of what the market says, that the state concern itself with the quality of goods, that the state prevent usury, quite an impossibility in that feverish age of speculation, but most of all, that it discipline all of those private entrepreneurs, all of those property holders who live only for their own profit and who are menaces to the welfare of the entire society. And so Bucer ends his track by saying, neither the Church of Christ nor the Christian Commonwealth or to tolerate such as prefer private gain to the public weal or seek it to hurt their neighbors. Now, is this all just pious, wishful thinking? Is this, after all, simply on paper? No, not if you realize that for well over a hundred years, in that long Tudor century, that there were repeated efforts, for example, on the part of the Tudor monarchy to legislate against the enclosure movement and to prevent the depopulation of the villages, to prevent the expulsion of the peasantry. The first of those laws in 1488, the last of them in 1621. And in that period of time, a tremendous effort to rein in the forces of market capitalism. Now granted that the monarchs had very special interests in wanting to end and stop enclosures. One was a military interest that after all, they, prov they provided themselves with armed forces largely through recruited militias. And who was good for a militia? Certainly not a vagabond, certainly not a fatigued Durban worker, but those sturdy peasants, those small peasants on the land, from the yeomanry all the way down to the poorest cutters, they were the ones with a stake in the land. They were the ones that would fight. And there was with that a financial and a fiscal interest. Because after all, the treasury was filled mainly from land taxes, mainly from the so-called subsidy on the land, which meant after all that given that very class orientation of tax assessments, that meant that the richest landowners paid the least, that if you drove the small peasants off the land, you would deplete your financial resources.
But let's not underestimate that the driving force behind this anti-enclosure legislation was a conservative social theory, in the best sense of the word conservative, that there was an effort to preserve the social pyramid, to preserve, after all, those unequal class relationships upon which that social pyramid rested, to protect the peasant and the craftsman in his estate just as the merchant and the landowner was protected in his estate, the estate to which divine providence had called everyone in the commonwealth. And so you get those laws, like the law of 1532, which set the limit of 2,200 sheep that anybody could own. And that would mean that you didn't need those immense sheep runs. And that would mean that you would reduce the passion to enclose land for pasture. Or the law of 1549, a little bit fantastic, that placed a poll tax on each head of sheep. And then, of course, in the end, it failed. And we know that the anti-enclosure legislation failed. And therein lies a story. Are the forces of the market, is capitalism so inexorable that not even legislation really can stop it? And what is at the root of that failure? In part, of course, that the crown itself in the Tudor period contributed to that very fever of commercialization of agriculture of which we have already described, to that conversion of land into a commodity to be bought and sold on the market. We know that Henry VIII seized the monastery lands we know that he put them up for sale and that he habituated an entire society to come into view land as a commodity for the market, to dropping those inhibitions which had traditionally said that you do not alienate land, that you do not sell it because it is a human environment. But even more important than that, you legislate against something, how do you enforce it? And the enforcement machinery is not adequate to the monarch's will. Because that enforcement machinery in England belongs to the class which will contest these regulations. It belongs in the local areas to the justices of the peace, uh, to those very men, whether they be gentry or merchants, who are into active uh, market activity up to their necks. And so when they enforce the law, they do not enforce it against their own interests. They let those pieces of legislation lapse, which will undercut their own sense of gain. And so those market forces prove to be inexorable. But look, let's face it, that there's something rather remarkable about the activity of a century to try to stop something that for small cutters and small peasants was a social catastrophe. Granted that it is rooted in paternalism. Granted that it is rooted in that social conservatism. But you see, it tells us something about the trauma of the transition to a capitalist mode of production that so many people in such high place, in fact, were worried about a community coming apart at the seams. Compare that to the two century later enclosure movement at the end of the 18th century. And then you realize what it means when a whole society becomes habituated to thinking of everything as a vendable commodity. Because in the late 18th century, when you have the great grain enclosures that effectively depopulate the villages, that create Oliver Goldsmith's deserted villages, that effectively capitalize agriculture once and for all in England, the state doesn't murmur a protest, but in fact approves at all a poor who had anything to do with the ruling classes. And so it is of some importance anyway that in the 16th century and early 17th, 
There was that deep apprehension that echoed so much in the past that we have tried to ferret out and root out, and that fundamentally meant that monarchs, for whatever self-interest, would run by that idea of stewardship that was so very well explicated by Thomas Lever, the favorite divine of Edward VI, who preached a sermon in 1550 before the king in which he said this, he who exploits his property with a single eye to its economic possibilities at once perverts its very essence and destroys his own moral title. Uh, but you see a discussion of anti-enclosure legislation in itself hardly distends to its full limits that entire anti-capitalist bias which you find in the social policy of Tudor and early Stuart monarchs. Because if you look, for example, at the data that have been adduced by Peter Ramsey in his very good book, Tudor Economic Problems, you find that Dr. Ramsey has listed 250 different pieces of legislation in the 16th century that sought to regulate economic activity and to restrain economic activity. They are pieces of legislation that try to impose something of a just or customary price, uh, that try to control the quality of products, uh, that try to prevent apprenticeship from dying so that the quality is kept up, and that most certainly try to preserve the society of orders and ranks so that each shall be able to live protected within that rank. And no body of legislation is more imposing in that direction than that legislation which was to culminate in the great statute of apprentices in 1563, by which the state tried to prevent the spread and the afflorescence of industrial capitalism unregulated into the countryside. Legislation against the spread of that industrial capitalism into the villages and into the small towns of England, out of the cities and among the peasants. Now you know from your reading of Maurice Dahl, who takes so much of his information from that very classic book of Professor George Unwin, called Industrial Organization in the 16th and 17th centuries, a book 75 years old and still deservedly a classic, that we know from Dobb or Unwin and others that the real development of capitalist labor relations and of capitalist modes of production came outside the cities and came in the countryside in the villages and in the small towns where the regulations of the cities could be easily escaped. And consequently, it was against that that the state would legislate. Now you understand that in England, as in every continental country, the cities are corporation cities, are regulated cities, that the industrial production in the cities is regulated, systematically organized into the guild system, and that the guilds, after all, take it as their function to restrict production, uh, to guard against adulteration and keep quality up, to make sure that the training in the craft is traditional and to the standard of that craft. But you know that the guilds in the 16th century were no models of democracy, that the guilds, after all, were highly stratified institutions in which little groups of avopolistic uh, uh, masters controlled those guilds and kept the journeymen and the apprentices at their levels so that to be journeyman and apprentice was rarely to exceed to the level of master.
And we know also that the guilds were jealous, monopolistic institutions. They were just like the American Medical Association. They kept production down to keep the prices up and the society be damned. And consequently, there are hardly models of social organization. But you can see that the state likes them because the guilds are predictable, because the state then knows how much is produced, knows what the workers are getting within their ranks. It's visible, predictable. It fits into that society of ranks and that society of orders. But then comes the temptation. And the temptation is to produce more. And the temptation is to make money. Now look, that the cloth trade of England, the woolen cloth trade, was something of a fever in the 16th century. <coughs> and everywhere in Europe, there were markets for English woolens that you could sell them at inflationary prices and make a real killing. That that English overseas cloth trade is the basis for the fortunes of a quasi-monopolistic corporation of London merchants known as the Merchant Adventurers, who traded those English cloths in the great commercial entrepot of Antwerp in Northern Europe, and there, in the first half of the 16th century, brought back annually profits of 25% on their export trade. So there was this burgeoning market, and surely there will be entrepreneurs who will want to cash in on it. And the way to cash in, if the guilds are restricted, is to escape the city, to go into the countryside, and there to exploit a cheap and abundant labor supply, and also to escape all rules and regulation of production. And so from the 15th century on, but especially in the 16th century, is this flood of the English cloth industry out into the countryside. And the primary mover is that merchant manufacturer known in the cloth trade as the clothier. And the clothier goes out and establishes in that most important industry what we call the domestic or the putting out system, in which the relationships of production, in which the relationship of classes begins already to foreshadow the capitalist relationships of a factory. Because this merchant manufacturer owns the raw material and not infrequently owns the <coughs> instrument of production and gives it out to the weaver living in his or her own cottage and there picks up the finished goods and pays peace rate for it. And so the relationship becomes really a capitalist wage earner relationship except for the fact and the important one that the worker still lives in his or her own domicile is not crowded into the factory for the most part of the 18th and the 19th centuries. But what you get out of that that is so advantageous is that burgeoning labor supply. We're talking about rural craftsmen who are into the weaving trade full time. We're talking about cotters or <coughs> agricultural workers who part time buttress their incomes by taking in weaving. We're talking about their wives who become spinners. And we're talking most certainly about unmarried women who have no other alternative if they are to survive in that society but to spin. Hence, from 16th century England, the word spinster, that unmarried woman who lives, after all, by the spinning of that cloth. And note also that it is not only an abundant labor supply, but a cheap one, because it hasn't gone through the apprenticeship rules. It learns things quickly, granted that the quality will be lower, granted that there will not be 
that sense of standard that there is in the city. But what difference? The market is burgeoning and it can all be sold. And without those town regulations, can the, art, the merchant manufacturer then introduce, if he chooses to do so, machinery, all kinds of things unheard of in the cities? And so the legislation. And the Crown legislates for a number of reasons. It legislates because the increase of that woolen trade in the countryside means an increase in the need for wool, and that encourages the enclosure movement. But more than that, the state is the pious mercantilist. It must preserve all in their ranks. And consequently, it cannot accept this undue competition to the master craftsmen of the cities or even uh, to the journeymen and the apprentices. It cannot countenance this attack upon apprenticeship, this attack upon skill, this attack upon standard, which is the pride of the worker in that ill system. And so the law of 1551, which legislates against the jig mill. Now the jig mill was a little, very simple machine. And its history is fascinating and tells us so much about what goes on in this social history. What the jig mill was, was a simple device which instead of having a very specialized artisan who was called a cropper lift or fluff up the nap on this cloth, this was a device in which the cloth was passed through cylinders fitted out with teasels that mechanically then raised the nap on the cloth, which effectively eliminated that artisan function of the cropper. And that protested by the state, prevented. Now this is anti-mechanization. It is anti-machinery. But it is also pro-skill. And the cropper, of course, fully approved in the cities. For he was concerned, after all, to make the very best out of that particular task. And he insisted that this machine could never do the task. And think of it. The struggle over the jig mill goes on for two centuries. That you get to the 18th century and you find that the jig mill is being introduced in the West Riding country, the big cloth making country in Northern England. And there, these croppers are organizing to prevent that machine from coming into the great city of Leeds. And for most of the 18th century, they keep it out. And then it penetrates that inexorable force of capitalism, that inexorable force of expanding these productive techniques. And finally, in those early years of the 19th century, when you get that great explosion of what is up, or machine wrecking, we will find that the croppers are right in there in the front, going into the mills and smashing these jig mills against which there had been legislation all the way back in this Tudor period. Or the law of 1558 that really tried to cripple the expansion of the cloth industry into the countryside. Listen to the preamble of that law of 1558. The weavers of the realm complain that the rich and wealthy clothiers do, in many ways, oppress them, some by setting up and keeping in their houses looms, and keeping and maintaining them by journeymen and persons unskillful, to the decay of a great number of urban craftsmen who have been brought up in the science of weaving. And so the law of 1558 proclaimed that no one could establish the cloth industry in any locality of England where it had not existed for 10 years previous to that. And that no master or merchant manufacturer, no clothier, could own more than one loom. And all of that culminated with the great statute of apprentices in 1563.
For there, the Tudor monarchy tried to generalize the seven-year apprenticeship law. That everybody who works in any craft that existed as of 1563 had to have gone through seven years of apprenticeship training at least. And more than that, that in the court industry per se, no one could enter as an apprentice except the son of a gentryman or the son of a yeoman who possessed land that was taxed at at least three pounds, all of which would have eliminated three-fourths of the workers in the cloth trade, effectively crippled that capitalistic enterprise out in the countryside. <coughs> now, we know perfectly well that that didn't happen. And we know that all of this legislation against rural capitalism was even less effective than the legislation against enclosures. And we know that the spirit and practice of capitalism penetrated that countryside. In part, of course, because of the problem simply of the law itself, that the law of 1563 said that there should be apprenticeship in all crafts that existed in that year. But what about all of those mining and metallurgical trades that would grow up in the latter part of the 16th and 17th centuries that were new and that consequently weren't covered by any kind of state legislation? But more than that, it's a problem again of enforcement. How to enforce this law when the justices of the peace are entrepreneurial, when they are disinterested in operating against their own economic well-being? And the parliament itself, that lower house, that house of commons, which has in it so many gentry, so many merchants, it after all serves as a negative check. It begins to amend pieces of legislation that the crown sends down, amends it in order to make that paternalism less astringent, all of the time, all of the time, simmering with resentment over the fact that there is any regulation at all, a resentment that will boil over in the 1640s, as you will see. And yet, despite the fact that it failed, before we go on to the victors, before we go on to those beer-drinking and God-fearing and hairy-chested entrepreneurs <laughs> who really remade society, let's note in passing, as Edward Thompson does in a very brilliant passage in the making of the English working class, that productive values, even though they are tremendously important, even though they surely are partially the explanation for this inexorable drive of capitalism, that production values may not be the very epitome of civilization, and that the paternalistic legislation of the Tudor monarchs may not be the height of folly. Because what Thompson writes in the making of the English working class, monism, machine wrecking, must be seen as arising at the crisis point in the abrogation of paternalist legislation and in the imposition of the political economy of laissez-faire upon and against the will and conscience of the working people. It is the last chapter of a story which begins in the 14th and 15th centuries and whose greater part has been told in Professor Tawney's Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. True enough, much of this paternalist legislation had been in origin not only restrictive, but for the working man, punitive. Nevertheless, there was within it the shadowy image of a benevolent corporate state in which there were legislated as well as moral sanctions against the unscrupulous manufacturer or the unjust employer, and in which the journeymen were recognized as an estate, however low, in the realm. The justice of the peace, at least in theory, could be turned to in the last extremity for arbitration. 
And even if practice taught working men to expect a dusty answer, it was still by this theory that the magistrate was judged. The function of industry was to provide a livelihood for those employed in it. And practices or inventions evidently destructive of the good of the trade were considered reprehensible. The journeyman took pride in his craft, not merely because it increased his value in the labor market, but because he was a craftsman. These ideals may never have been much more than ideals, but by the end of the 18th century, they had become threadbare. But they still had a powerful reality, nonetheless, in the notion of what ought to be, to which artisans, journeymen, and many small masters were so long to appeal. And so the victors are the entrepreneurs, and they are not legislated, and they are not regulated. And in the cloth trade, we certainly find that. And if you read the sources about the growth of that rural cloth industry in England, you get a kind of picture in mind of one of these clothiers and how he becomes richer all the time. And he has a warehouse, and he has teams of horses, and he goes round to an increasingly large circuit of weavers, of those craftsmen in cottages, and he gives out that raw material, and some, some, sometimes the machinery, and his bargaining power is terrific, because after all, those small craftsmen have to eat, and consequently they accept whatever terms he imposes. And then he goes into the raw material market, and he buys very frequently very large supplies, enough for a year, so that he can keep off from the market until such time as the price is right and he can get the greatest profit. And if you go one step further, then you actually find, even in that primitive era of industrial capitalism, that great and beneficent joy, the factory. And so you find William Stump of Marlsborough. And William Stump, legendary in the 16th century, the clothier who established the largest of those factories. In Malmesbury, he found an old monastery which gave up its buildings and lands to the crown in 1539. And he bought those buildings and part of the land for 1,500 pounds. And he had as many as 250 looms inside those buildings. And he had a weaving factory and he sold direct into the London market. And he became very rich, and so, in that kind of inevitable link between economic and political power, he became a justice of the peace, a magistrate, and a very rich landowner by the time he died in 1555. And we know that three times he was dragged up before Chancery Court by very aggrieved copyholders who had been shoved off the land by him, which led, leads Professor Gough, his biographer, to say of William Stump, he was typical of the new style landlords who exploited their property simply as business investments and none other. And so you get those extravagant examples, money. But if you're interested in money, then you should go not, after all, into an old monastic building. You should go underground and get the orbs that presumably were placed there for you. The consequence it is that in mining, after all, you get the greatest fortunes of the age, and coal mining in the 16th century in England is the great expansionist trade for reasons not hard to discover. That timber is in short supply. It is needed for shipbuilding. It is needed for housing of burgeoning cities and consequently becomes too expensive for fuel. And more and more, householders turn to coal as the substitute fuel. And that means that for entrepreneurs who can really invest, which takes money, invest in coal mining, there is a killing to be made. It is in the city of Newcastle, 
on the Tyne River, Newcastle on Tyne, that defined the greatest export city of coal in 16th and 17th century England. And if you look at the statistics, that in the year 1560, 33,000 tons of coal passed through Newcastle, and in 1609, 260,000 tons passed through Newcastle, you can see what that expansion is about. And so you get examples, once again, of great fortunes made. The example of Thomas Sutton. Thomas Sutton wasn't even a resident of Derbyshire when he got a huge concession from the Crown because of connections in the court for a mining terrain. And there he got that concession on a 99-year lease for the payment of 90 pounds a year. Now you see you're all born three centuries too late. And consequently, what Thomas Sutton did was to build up such vast fortunes in that coal mining and in land ownership. By the time of his death, he was netting about 65,000 pounds a year, which in 20th century terms is astronomical in status of multimillionaire. But a parenthesis, that it is exactly in mining that you come to understand something of the cost of all of this, something of what it is about. Because, you see, we talk about the freedoms that capitalism brings in labor relationships, in social status, and we talk about the unfreedom of the Middle Age. And I submit to you that in more occasions than frequently meets the eye, that the illusion of the new, that the freedom of the new was illusory, and that the unfreedom of the medieval proved to be in practice sometimes more varied, sometimes even more free, and never more so than if you think, for example, about the tinners, the tin miners of Cornwall, or about the lead miners of Derbyshire. Because those tinners in the Middle Ages were like, let us say, gold prospectors in California or Australia in the 19th century. They really were independent adventurers, and they had by law and custom the right as independent adventurers to go and to mine ore and to have access to the streams so that they could dig that ore out. And consequently, what you get are really small companies of independent tin miners. By the 15th century, the whole process begins to change. You begin to get that division of labor. You begin to get that differentiation, which really does mean, inevitably, the loss of independency. So the tinner, for example, cannot sell his tin unless he has it stamped in a royal office. <laughs>